Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Halloween edition of Off the Deaton Path. My name is Stan Deaton with the Georgia Historical Society, and I welcome you to the October 31st, 2017 edition of our podcast. We are recording this week from the Manor House of Baltus Van Tassel, overlooking the placid waters, the beautiful landscape of the Tapan Z, and the Sleepy Hollow Churchyard, and we welcome you here. Before we get started in this week's uh, show, I have two things I want to mention that are left over from the podcast that we did a couple of weeks ago. This is related to John Denver. I mentioned that it was the 20th anniversary of John Denver's death. There were two things I left out of the information that I gave you. I mentioned that the backup singers for his classic country song or his classic hit song, Take Me Home Country Roads, uh, Bill Nivert and Taffy Danoff were known as the Fat City Band. They went on to become the Starland Vocal Band, which in 1976 recorded the top hit, Afternoon Delight. So when you hear that, remember that you're hearing the uh, the group that sang Back Up on John Denver. And I mentioned that John Denver was tragically killed 20 years ago in an airplane crash uh, into uh, Monterey Bay. His ashes were taken back, he was taken back uh, to Colorado and cremated and his ashes scattered in the shadow of the great Rocky Mountains that he loved. So I uh, wanted to uh, close the loop on John Denver from two weeks ago. We're going to do something different this week. This being the Halloween edition, I thought it might be fun to read a ghost story to you. I am a great fan of the ghost story, the classic Victorian and Edwardian ghost stories. If you are readers of my blog, and of course you are. Uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote a blog called There's Something Out There, which was all about the different ghost stories that I've read and that I've recommend to you. I have a whole, whole shelf of, of ghost stories. And every October, uh, as the days get shorter and the nights get darker and longer, I like to read these when I'm reading in the morning. Um, they're scary as they can be. The ones that I really recommend the most and love the most were written by uh, an English professor named M. R. James, Montague Rhodes James. He wrote some of the most classic ghost stories uh, that were ever printed, and I highly recommend them to you. Penguin has come out with two paperback versions of his stories. They're easily accessible, easily found, highly entertaining, and very scary. But the person who I'm going to read to you this week is a, a pretty much an unknown author, as so many of the authors of these 20th century or 18th, 19th, and 20th century ghost stories that I love are. Uh, this is a gentleman named William Fryer Harvey, who was born in 1885 in England into a Quaker family, and he became a doctor. So he was always known as Doctor Harvey while he was alive, and during World War I, in spite of being a Quaker, he joined a unit called the Friends Ambulance Unit. The Friends, of course, referring to the Quakers. And he later served as a surgeon lieutenant in the Royal Navy. And in 1918, he received the Albert Medal for Life Saving when he risked his life to perform an amputation on an engineer who was trapped in the wreck of a flooding engine room of a naval destroyer. So if you can imagine, it's almost a scene out of a movie. The room is flooding, there's an engineer who's trapped under a piece of wreckage, and Dr. Harvey came on board and risked his own life to perform an amputation in order to free up the engineer. And in doing so, Harvey himself was dragged out unconscious from the effect of oil fumes from which his lungs never fully recovered. And in addition to a distinguished medical career, he, as so many doctors are or like to be, he was a frustrated writer, and so he wrote a number of short stories and turned them into books in his lifetime. Many of his short stories are classic horror stories, including his most famous called The Beast with Five Fingers. I'm not going to read that today, but it is well worth reading. It inspired a slew of knockoffs on television and movies, and it inspired the character Thing on The Addams Family, which you no doubt remember. Harvey himself died on June 4, 1937 at the young age, and I can say that, <laughs> of the age of 52, and is buried in the churchyard of St. Mary the Virgin in Old Letchworth in England. Now, the story I'm going to share with you today is called The Clock, and it was written in 1928. And it shares, it's a very short story, so you're not going to be bored to death here. And it shares many of the features of Harvey's stories, and quite frankly, many of the features of the classic ghost stories, in that it's unresolved in the end, as you will see. There are vague hints of the unseen, and as all ghost stories, really good ones do, it sets a mood. It's really creepy. I hope you enjoy it. The Clock by William Fryer Harvey 
I liked your description of the people at the pension. I can see just the picture of the rather sinister Miss Cornelius with her tope and clinking bangles. I don't wonder you felt frightened that night when you found her sleepwalking in the corridor. But after all, why shouldn't she sleepwalk? As to the movements of the furniture in the lounge on the Sunday, you are, I suppose, in an earthquake zone. Though an earthquake seems too big an explanation for the ringing of that little handbell on the mantelpiece. It's rather as if our parlor maid, another new one, were to call a stray elephant to account for the teapot we found broke yesterday. You have at least escaped the eternal problem of the maids in Italy. Yes, my dear, I most certainly believe you. I have never had experiences quite like yours, but your mention of Miss Cornelius has reminded me of something rather similar that happened nearly twenty years ago, soon after I left school. I was staying with my aunt in Hempstead. You remember her, I expect. Or, if not her, the poodle, Monsieur, that she used to make perform such pathetic tricks. There was another guest, whom I never met before, a Mrs. Caleb. She lived in Lewes and had been staying with my aunt for about a fortnight, recuperating after a series of domestic upheavals, which had culminated in her two servants leaving her at an hour's notice, without any reason, according to Mrs. Caleb. But I wondered. I had never seen the maids. I had seen Mrs. Caleb, and frankly, I disliked her. She left the same sort of impression on me as I gather your secretive Miss Cornelius leaves on you. Something queer and secretive. Underground, if you can use the expression, rather than underhand. And I could feel in my body that she did not like me. It was summer. Joan Denton, you remember her, her husband was killed in Gallipoli, had suggested that I should go down to spend the day with her. Her people had rented a little cottage some three miles out of Luz. We arranged a day. It was gloriously fine for a wonder, and I had planned to leave that stuffy old Hampstead house before the old ladies were astir. But Mrs. Caleb waylaid me in the hall, just as I was going out. I wonder, she said, I wonder if you could do me a small favor. If you do have any time to spare in Luz, only if you do, would you be so kind as to call at my house? I left a little traveling clock there in the hurry of the parting. If it's not in the drawing room, it will be in my bedroom or in one of the maid's bedrooms. I know I lent it to the cook, who was a poor riser, and I can't remember if she returned it. Would it be too much to ask? The house has been locked up for twelve days, but everything is in order. I have the keys here. The large one is for the garden gate, the small one for the front door. I could only accept, and she proceeded to tell me how I could find Ash Grove House. You will feel quite like a burglar, she said, but mind, it's only if you have time to spare. As a matter of fact, I found myself glad of any excuse to kill time. Poor old Joan had been taken suddenly ill in the night. They feared appendicitis. And though her people were very kind and asked me to stay to lunch, I could see that I should only be in the way and made Mrs. Caleb's commission an excuse for an early departure. I found Ash Grove without difficulty. It was a medium-sized red brick house, standing by itself in a high-walled garden that bounded a narrow lane. A flagged path led from the gate to the front door, in front of which grew not an ash, but a monkey puzzle that must have made the room unnecessarily gloomy. The side door, as I expected, was locked. The dining room and drawing room lay on either side of the hall, and, as the windows of both were shuttered, I left the hall door open and in the dim light looked around hurriedly for the clock, which, from what Mrs. Caleb had said, I hardly expected to find in either of the downstairs rooms. It was neither on the table nor mantelpiece. The rest of the furniture was carefully covered over with white dust sheets. Then I went upstairs. But before doing so, I closed the front door. I did, in fact, feel rather like a burglar, and I thought that if anyone did happen to see the front door open, I might have difficulty in explaining things. Happily, the upstairs windows were not shuttered. I made a hurried search of the principal bedrooms. They had been left in apple pie order. Nothing was out of place but there was no sign of Mrs. Caleb's clock. The impression the house gave me, you know the sense of personality that a house conveys, was neither pleasing nor displeasing, but it was stuffy 
stuffy from the absence of fresh air, with an additional stuffiness added that seemed to come from the hangings and quilts and anti macassars The corridor on which the bedrooms I had examined opened communicated with a smaller wing, an older part of the house, I imagined, which contained a box room and the maid's sleeping quarters. The last door I unlocked. I should say the doors of all the rooms were locked and relocked by me after I had glanced inside them. Contained the object of my search. Mrs. Caleb's traveling clock was on the mantelpiece, ticking away merrily. That was how I thought of it at first. And then for the first time I realized that there was something wrong. The clock had no business to be ticking. The house had been shut up for twelve days. No one had come in to air it or to light fires. I remembered how Mrs. Caleb had told my aunt that if she left the keys with the neighbor, she was never sure who might get hold of them. And yet the clock was going. I wondered if some vibration had set the mechanism in motion and pulled out my watch to see the time. It was five minutes to one. The clock on the mantelpiece said four minutes to the hour. Then, without quite knowing why, I shut the door on the landing, locked myself in, and again looked round the room. Nothing was out of place. The only thing that might have called for a mark was that there appeared to be a slight indentation on the pillow in the bed. But the mattress was a feather mattress, and you know how difficult it is to make them perfectly smooth. You don't need to be told that I gave a hurried glance under the bed. Do you remember your supposed burglar in number six at St. Ursula's? And then, and much more reluctantly, opened the doors of two horribly capacious cupboards, both happily empty except for a framed text with its face to the wall. By this time, I really was frightened. The clock went ticking on. I had a horrible feeling that an alarm might go off at any moment, and the thought of being in that empty house was almost too much for me. However, I made an attempt to pull myself together. It might, after all, be a 14-day clock. If it were, then it would be almost run down. I could roughly find out how long the clock had been going by winding it up. I hesitated to put the matter to the test, but the uncertainty was too much for me. I took it out of its case and began to wind. I had scarcely turned the winding screw twice when it stopped. The clock clearly was not running down. The hands had been set in motion probably only an hour or two before. I felt cold and faint. Going to the window, threw up the sash, letting in the sweet live air of the garden. I knew now that the house was queer, horribly queer. Could someone be living in the house? Was someone else in the house now? I thought I had been in all the rooms, but had I? I had only just opened the bathroom door, and I had certainly not opened any cupboards except those in the room in which I was. Then, as I stood by an open window, wondering what I should do next and feeling that I just couldn't go down that corridor into the darkened hall to fumble the latch at the front door with I don't know what behind me, I heard a noise. It was very faint at first and seemed to be coming from the stairs. It was a curious noise. Not the noise of anyone climbing up the stairs, but you will laugh if this letter reaches you by a morning post of something hopping up the stairs like a very big bird would hop. I heard it on the landing. It stopped. Then there was a curious scratching noise against one of the bedroom doors, the sort of noise you can make with the nail of your little finger scratching polished wood. Whatever it was, was coming slowly down the corridor, scratching at the doors as it went. I could stand it no longer. Nightmare pictures of locked doors opening filled my brain. I took up the clock, wrapped it in my Macintosh, and dropped it out of the window onto a flower bed. Then I managed to crawl out of the window, and getting a grip on the sill, successfully negotiated, as the journalist would say, a 12-foot drop. So much for our abused gym at St. Ursula's. Picking up the Macintosh, I ran round to the front door and locked it. Then I felt I could breathe, but not until I was on the far side of the gate in the garden wall did I feel safe.
Then I remembered that the bedroom window was open. What was I to do? Wild horses wouldn't have dragged me into the house again unaccompanied. I made up my mind to go to the police station, tell them everything. I should be laughed at, of course, and they might easily refuse to believe my story of Mrs. Caleb's commission. I had actually begun to walk down the lane in the direction of the town when I chanced to look back at the house. The window that I had left open was shut. No, my dear, I didn't see any face or anything dreadful like that. And, of course, it may have shut by itself. It was an ordinary sash window, and you know they're often difficult to keep open. And the rest? Why, there's really nothing more to tell. I didn't even see Mrs. Caleb again. She had some sort of fainting fit just before lunchtime, my aunt informed me on my return, and had to go to bed. Next morning, I traveled down to Cornwall to join Mother and the children. I thought I had forgotten all about it, but when three years later Uncle Charles suggested giving me the traveling clock for a 21st birthday present, I was foolish enough to prefer the alternative that he offered, a collected edition of the works of Thomas Carlyle. And that is The Clock by William Fryer Harvey. We hope you enjoyed it. Our producer this week is Jeffrey Crayon, and as always, I hope that if you have any complaints about this podcast, if you didn't like the story or you didn't like the way I read it, or if you just didn't even like the sound of my voice, I hope that you'll write to Jeffrey and let him know all about that. Our mailman this week and every week is one Gary F. Taylor, born and raised. That's right. Our caterer this week is Hagee's House of Tacos, home of the Drippy Enchilada. Our legal counsel this week and every week is the law office of Gallipo and Taylor, where their motto is, your money is safer with us. The hardest working engineer in show business is our very own Brendan Cannonball Crellin. You can find out everything that's going on at the Georgia Historical Society at georgiahistory.com. And you can check out my blog and other similarly painful podcasts at off the Deaton Path at deatonpath.georgiahistory.com. You can also now hear our podcast uh, on the Apple App Store and on Google Play. So tell your friends and family, after all, why should you be the only one who is miserable? We hope that you have a very happy Halloween. See you back here next week. So long, everybody.